Welcome everyone to the beginning of our fourth season of doing these webinars. This is webinar number 4-1 uh, since we've started them. Um, uh, it's our 155th webinar that we've done and um, uh, looking forward to this one. We've, uh, we've been lots and lots of improvements in Ray Studio 3 data analysis and lots of people are, are starting to use it. Um, uh, to do their analysis, they're transitioned over, you know, from the from Ray Studio 2, it always takes a little bit of time for a user to, to uh, usually winter over where they can actually during the winter start to use the new updated software and begin to, you know, dive into what is uh, you know, uh, powerful and good about it. So it's a, a great time for us to do another series on uh, just focusing on Ray Studio 3 uh, analysis functions. And not only the functions of the, you know, how to push a button and how to make it work, but, but um, um, from from users that are very good at it to come in here and and talk about, you know, here's what what you're looking at, here's what you're seeing in your, uh, you know, out your window of your race car, and what's it look like in the data. Number one, how to get it to look in in certain ways, how to set up the computer, how to set up Race Studio, and then to understand from the squiggly lines or from the graphs or from the all the different ways that we can look at the data, is it um, uh, is it optimized? Is it is it a good breaking zone? Is it a poor breaking zone? So we're going to talk about all of those different things. Uh, Paul Wilson uh, has a question there that uh, that live. Uh, that uh, you know, what's brake speed? Well, we're gonna we're gonna define that and that in the, here here in just a moment with a couple of the, of the slides because it's a part of what you should be looking looking at as you're uh, trying to understand how well you're doing. You know, the short answer is is you come off the throttle, you hit the brake. How fast do you apply the brake? How fast do you get from zero psi to to the maximum 800 psi that your car has available to you. Those are things, if you know that, then you can start to analyze uh, what you're doing and, and to try some different things. Maybe you're applying it too fast or uh, or, or not fast enough. We'll, we'll take a look at it. And, and not only how you apply them, but how you come off of the brake. Do you come off the brake too fast? Um, so it's not, it's not just pressure, but it's the steepness of that pressure growth. So uh, great question. And, it's, uh, and it is one of those channels that uh, a lot of people would not normally see or, or work with all the time, but that's what's part of what we're doing here today is to, to look at that. Um, as we get going, for those of you that are watching here live, there is a, a, a question and answer box to, to, to give us some questions. For those that are watching later on, um, on YouTube, down in the description box below, there will be a, um, uh, links to the, to the presentation uh, down below, there will be links to user profiles to help you get your software, take Ray Studio, download the user profiles, apply them to, um, to your version of Ray Studio 3 analysis, and, and, and have, a, have a user profile that is set up to make your screens look like the ones that we're using to shorten the learning curve and get you to, to where we're at if you want to, right? You may just take pieces of what we're doing, but uh, we'll make that user profile available for you. And then we will also be making the math channels that you're going to see today will be available as a download uh, from from the um, from the links below. They're available here for all the folks here in the in the chat box. Those links are available, so keep that in mind. Okay, the um, Ray Phillips is here to join us. This I think is Ray's. It's his seventh time of joining us. Uh, he 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 worked with us and did a couple of webinars in the. Uh, the first year when we started to do these, the first season, and uh, the second, the third, and now, of course, this being the fourth season, he's our first co-host or first guest that is is uh, done one every year for us. So that's, uh, we, we thank you, Ray. Uh, very, very uh, helpful and very nice to, to work with folks like you that are that are, are, are really into this and, and do such a good job and come here and share your information. Thank you and uh, hope you enjoy yourself today. No, I, I'm sure I will. I love doing these things. It's always fun. Find the time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You, uh, it, it, as we've been preparing, uh, Ray's been on flights, and we've been chatting back and forth in between uh, in between things. So Ray is a very busy man. Uh, you would think um, I'm here from the Seattle area, Ray's from the East Coast, but you would think uh, that there would be an off season or a winter in in motorsports, but not when you not when you travel like Ray, right? It's uh, you're, you, you. There is good weather down south in the in the states here. 
So yeah. um, the uh, Ray owns precision driving analytics and has been around motorsports for a long time, 28 years. And um, the uh, uh, what's what I always find uh, interesting about Ray, I, 28 years, basically a lifer, right? You're here. You're, 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 you know, you're going to be here for a while, right? Um, uh, what I've always thought makes a good uh, a data analyst or somebody that's looking at data is uh, somebody that has, uh, you know, some feel for the cars as well. Certainly you can overcome that. You can come out of college and, and, and learn the computer side, the, the data analysis software and, and, and do a, you know, do a decent job of being um, a, a data guy. But the um, uh, race got a lot of, of seat time in the cars as well. And that gives uh, a natural bit of knowledge of the feel of cars. And some of the stuff that he's going to talk about today comes from, from that. And so I look forward to that. Uh, Ray's been doing this for um, as a uh, uh, as his vocation for quite some time. A data engineer, uh, one of one just one of the highlights was uh, he was the data engineer for the Ferrari Challenge Championship team back in uh, 2019. Um, I know he's hoping to do that again uh, with a couple of different teams this year, uh, yeah. different uh, different organizations and different racing uh, venues. So he's out there continually. Uh, being a, uh, um, a data engineer with teams. So looking forward to that. Where have you been lately, Ray? And what, uh, and where are you going to be uh, coming up soon? Uh, well, let's see. I've been to Sebring twice this month. Uh, next stop is Homestead and then to Coda and then back to Homestead. And then uh, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that becomes a blur. <laughs> I think it's Sebring again. <laughs> the, the, first, the first part of it was a blur for me. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the way it happens. Uh, Ray, Ray and I were chatting last night about uh, you know flights that you end up changing and moving and and uh, you end up heading off and think you're coming home on Wednesday and you're you, you end up at another venue, right? You you just keep on going around and finally you're you make that trip home and you can you know clean out the luggage and and uh, repack, right? It takes a, sometimes it takes a while. Yeah. So perfect. The um. What we're going to talk about today is is kind of the generic overall view a little bit because Ray is a is not only a, a an accomplished racer uh, and 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 data uh, person he sell he sells AIM products and, and other products as well and uh, and and does a ton of support with uh with, with users uh, not only as customers at the track while he's there but also has some processes and places where he can help people set up these user profiles or these math channels directly for for them for for more information uh, contact ray directly but um but what i wanted to start maybe with ray was maybe ray, talk a little bit about you know you've got your driver coach hat on for just a moment and you're you've got a new client you're coming up to to, to sebring or wherever you're going to be um since we're breaking this up into pieces uh, for these analysis webinars today we're going to talk about the breaking uh, and and the corner entry and focus just on that but when you're talking to somebody what parts are important to you kind of give a hierarchy of yeah they're heading down the straightaway you know break down a corner and 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 say what Give us an idea of how you would coach somebody to what to think about before they go out there first time. Uh, just kind of break down a corner for us and how how you see it and how we're going to kind of apply some of that here today. Well, I think, you know, the very first thing is make sure they're driving the right line. <laughs> you know, so if they don't have the right, the right line. They're not going to do uh, a lot of the other things correctly. But once uh, they're driving the right line and hitting the apex appropriately, then you've got to start thinking about, okay, you know, where are they hitting the brakes? Are they having their eyes up to look for that apex? Um, probably the most important thing is how they come off the brakes. Um, how do they transition between the brake pedal and throttle? How fast are they using the steering wheel? You know, all these things are different for different speed corners. So it really all depends on what the corner is and what that driver is dealing with at that particular moment. Um, but I look at all that stuff, you know, um, I think the speed at which, uh, drivers use controls is a big one because I end up looking at, um, pro driver data and amateur data. And that's usually where I see the biggest difference is the speed at which they're using the controls. And it, it sounds funny, but, um, the whole adage smooth is fast. A lot of people think that's related to the steering wheel. 
It's really not. It's more related to uh, the brake and throttle pedal, how how they're transitioning from braking to throttle application. And then steering can be very quick in the middle of a corner, right? Because that's if the car's on the ragged edge, that's how the pro driver keeps it there. So, yeah, perfect. The uh, and and we have a question right off the bat that kind of fits into this, and I and I'd like to add just a little bit to that as well. Bjorn asks, you know, uh, we're looking at uh, the slide we're looking at happens to be on on the screen right now. There is some variation here in in the brake pressure traces. Uh, looking beyond the uh, overall right wrong uh, issues but there we see some differences there and Bjorn's asking some things about how much is that the the driver doing some of that how much is the uh, that you're at Sebring and, it, and it's bouncy and bumpy right or or uh, the uh, and and you know what track you're at you know the driver you're with uh, how do you look past some of that and 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 try to say you know here's where here's how we do this or look at what's happening here this is probably um the bumps this is probably the when you're heel and towing this is probably you know just digging into these uh these bumpy brake position traces yeah i mean uh first of all these are all done on a simulator these are all me so i know there was no bumps but <laughs> 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 but uh but you know i guess you you i i personally know what i'm looking for in regards to a trace if if there's some reason that's not able to happen, then you start looking for other things. You know, is there a bump there? Can you see a bump in the video? Can I look at the vertical acceleration and see that there's a bump? And I can I find a correlation between that bump and the brake pressure changing? You know, so, you know, that's when you have to kind of dive in a little bit deeper and see if there's something else that's outside of the driver's control um, that's preventing them from doing what we really want them to do. It's kind of funny, but there's a, I what I would do if that question, and as you're going through it and I'm thinking, okay, well, how would I find that? Uh, exactly what you just talked about, you know, start looking at either the shock pots in, in an XY plot, right? Shock pot compression versus versus uh, brake pressure and see if there is a trend that matches up, right? For bumps mm -hmm. with with releases or spikes, you know, you could do that or, or uh, the, the vertical on a uh, on an accelerometer and, right. and see if there's something there. Uh, it, it just, or the other part of this is, is, is the car, the way the car is set up and it, is the driver's knee almost straight when he's when they're when they're uh, hitting the brakes right or is he a little bit too far away from the pedal he's a little bit too close and his knee is hitting the steering wheel why he's why they right. are uh, trying to uh, apply the brakes there's all sorts of interesting things you or you can go to uh, the data is it has lots and lots of great answers but sometimes it opens up more questions right yeah yeah perfect Absolutely. perfect okay let's talk a little bit to to kind of break into um the process of breaking down this corner the while you mentioned this was done on a on a simulator uh, gosh i the uh the simulators are so good nowadays and our ability to bring that data in is is uh sometimes in fact when you were showing me this data and we were talking about it i i did not know it was simulator data until you mentioned it uh so the um uh, let's talk a little bit about these break and brake velocity traces that you've shown here and start to make the connection between what the pressure traces, which are the red ones up above the orange ones, and then the green one down below, which is that uh, that uh, brake speed trace. Right. So, yeah, the reason why uh, like the on and off is flat at the very top is because, you know, it came from a simulator. So it, I went beyond the 100 percent with my brake pedal. So but. <laughs> I think it still shows what I what what I really wanted to show, which is you know I'm off, on very quickly and I'm off very quickly, and frankly I can't really think of any situation where that's appropriate in a race car. Um, you know, I I guess that the reason for that is because we always want a little bit of a trail at the very least on the slow release of the brake pedal. And what we're going to get into is load transfer, and that's all going to make more sense when we start talking about that. But well, what's uh, interesting about that is the we have this brake speed trace down that you're trying to people are going to try to wrap their heads around, right? So right. when you have this this straight up to 100 percent, you know, maybe call it a thousand psi, and it and the right. sensor was you you overtop the sensor or something, so we got the the flat top, but it shows that this this velocity trace down here below. 
when it's positive like this, that means how fast and how steep this line was, where, if, where this is a little bit uh, laid back, you know, 45 degree angle. And so the velocity of the application of the brake is, uh, is substantially less. So the, uh, the higher the, the, the magnitude of the velocity, uh, the higher the speed that you have applied the brakes and, and built that pressure up. So this is actually, while you may not see this very often, it, it does give you the, you, you hit the brakes fast, the velocity was up, and when you released it, it's a negative number pointing down, and just to try to get everybody to start thinking about what these green lines are down below. Right, and from a real world perspective, I, I do look at this a lot, and one thing I'm looking for is to make sure that the um, negative brake velocity is not as much as the application velocity. You know, I really should never see that. Uh, as as I was coming up through motorsports as a dad with a son in in uh, in, in road racing, it uh, as we would just be chatting around with different people that had a lot more experience in the paddock area, and we we were never able to get a ton of different coaches, but uh, just financially, but the, uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, during those discussions, uh, my, my eyes opened pretty quickly that virtually all of these experienced good driver coaches were, would be telling us that it's, uh, the first place they look is on the brake release, not the brake application, just like right. you did, uh, just as you kind of led into this a little bit ago. So uh, yeah. I think that's just good, good, uh, good information. Okay. Yeah. You have three different other uh, pieces here. Let's, let's talk about the, let's talk about this second one. Yeah. So the soft initial application, um, you know, I, I have had clients do that and they're just a little bit um, apprehensive about that first initial application of the brakes. And they're, they're really taking time off the clock. You know, if the car can't handle that initial application at over a hundred some miles an hour, there's something else going on there. Right. Um, that particular trace may be appropriate if the driver has to have some steering input prior to getting on full brake pressure. You know, that's about the only time that I would see something like that. Um, you have drivers that sometimes the car is loose in, right? Or, or yeah. it's a rain, rain event. The, uh, I actually meant to kind of start off this webinar, you know, talking about some of those things like that. We're going to talk about these traces like there is, there is a, and, and it is true that there is a proper way to do this, but data is not perfect, right? It's uh, there, we, we are in a car and we are out on a track and that track is not perfectly flat and smooth and, and dry and high grip. And so there's, there, there might be a time when you are studying your own breaking into a corner and maybe the corner drops off and, and, and the, and the trail breaking starts right when you go over a hill and lose some grip and you, and you may not be able to, uh, to bring this break up in, in exactly the perfect way. That is all part of it. You have to start to understand when this might be the right thing to do. So it's, it's always a, there's always a balance here. If it was easy, uh, even I would do it. Right. So, so we have to, uh, we, we have to, be educated enough, and that's hopefully what we're doing is sharing with you some different stories, uh, so you can start to read them uh, and, and and understand what you're looking at. Right. Okay, so this one was a little bit on the soft initial, and then looks like it's pretty good and a, and a fast fall off, right? I mean, right. You, one of the things you mentioned was this this uh, derivative, um, the the velocity or the speed of the brake is is almost as as uh, high in the in the negative direction as it is in the positive direction. David right. Farrington had a question here that we'll, let's cover real quickly since we're talking about it. Is I pr I presume there's a math function for brake velocity and and there is and it's not just for brakes, but there in the math channels there is a uh, a channel that's called the derivative, and if you can take the 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 channel of anything and it, it it's the der derivative, uh, and then in in brackets you put the channel. And it might be the throttle, it might be the brake, it might, whatever you want to see a, a channel that is changing fairly quickly, you do the derivative of it and you end up with the velocity of change of that particular channel. And that's what Ray has built here for the, uh, for the brakes in this case. But uh, I see a lot of people do it on steering, brakes and throttle. We want to know how smooth and how fast is that driver changing uh, either their hands or, the, or their feet, right? The, the driver right. inputs. So those are real popular uh, uh, derivative channels where you get the velocities. Yeah. Okay, Ray, let's talk a little bit about the, the brake release, brake again, um, uh, curse. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, 
you know, show which one bothers me the most, but uh, let's talk, let's talk <laughs> about that one. <laughs> well, I mean, for new drivers, that's probably the, the trace that I see the most. Um, and I guess the reason for that is, is that there could be several reasons. One uh, is usually the eyes. It's they're usually not looking far enough ahead. Um, and they just haven't mastered that whole brake release thing either. So they get on the brakes, they've kind of realized that they may have braked too early. So then they start to release and then they realize, oh, wait, now I'm approaching the apex faster than I thought I was going to be. And now I break, they break again. So, um, it's, it tells me right off the bat that they can break later and they can, uh, trail probably more and, you know, basically get that car to the apex with more weight on the nose. And uh, anyway, just counter any uh, understeer and all that may develop as well. Yeah, you as a driver coach, the, a very, very strong hint that the, this is a this is something you can work on. And it's a, um, you and I chatted at, about it a little bit uh, yesterday, and I've talked a lot about it on here. That braking area where that initial braking and then down through where you start to turn in, is a very very busy time for drivers, and especially as they're learning to to uh, uh, to, to to do the braking better. That that you, you've you've just come off the straightaway. You're trying to figure out. You'll pick up that initial braking point, and uh, and that's a high stress time, right? Should I go to the to the four or the four and a half instead of the five this time? <laughs> you know, that that's a that, uh, the consequences are high if you if you do it wrong. So you're worrying about that, and then of course then you got to release off of the throttle and go to the brake and um and then you then you get after the brakes and you got to worry about locking it up and you know and keeping it straight and and all of this time you're having to glance in the mirrors is my buddy over here going to dive inside of me you know all of these things are happening right and then you got to start uh, downshifting and looking for your turn in point and how much do you turn in it's a very very busy time and yeah. i have ran into a lot of drivers that don't even realize they're doing this uh outside oh, yeah. of the car inside sure. clearly their mind's eye is is seeing that they let off too early and they released the brake and then went back at it, but they don't even re recall it afterwards. So this is a right. the data is a very, very strong point for us here. Yeah, I would say most drivers don't realize that they're doing it. You know, they have to find it in the data in order yeah. to see. So that's a that's a that's a very good very good point there. The other one that I found on this, on, you know, and again, you you built these traces uh, you know, to this, but we see these things, right? So then the driver. Uh, did go back to the brakes a little bit right here, about the two thirds of the way through, and then ended up having to take a nice hard stab just before it was time to come off the brakes, right? right. And probably had turned in a little bit about that. You you mentioned just a second ago as you were talking that that was that last stab here, and then the huge release creates a, a whole series of problems that we'll talk about more in a moment. Where you now you've turned in a little bit and you've got that that front outside front tire is loaded up you're trying to turn and all of a sudden you throw a bunch more uh, weight and uh, and load up on that on that one corner and you're trying to ask it to break and turn and uh and that entry understeer happens when you see when you get this a lot so yeah. okay and then we always want to give you some of the bad you know some of the wrong stuff right and then but we'd like to give you a you know what what would look like a, a probably your classic uh correct brake trace so let's talk about that one a little bit yeah so you can see that you know there's a quick initial brake application and then as the driver is approaching the apex he's you know releasing the brake pedal and hopefully timing it such that if at least if it's a slow corner uh, such that the he's off the brake pedal just before the apex or at the apex and you can see from the brake velocity you know that's what you're looking for you got the initial quick um, brake application and then a very slow release so that there's not very many traces below the zero mark. Um, so even if it's a fast corner, uh, you may not be trail braking to the apex, but you still kind of want that, that slow release, at least to an extent, because that's how you're controlling the weight transfer, you know, the load transfer across the car, which we're going to get into, but yeah. And I see a couple of questions there that talk about it. And that's exactly where we're going to go with a lot of the uh, next few slides, talking about the chassis platform and understanding what the braking is doing and how to see it well in the data. What is that doing to the chassis? 
and then uh, and then turning in and how that rolls the weight uh, from the different corners. That's a big part of what we're going to talk about today. So that uh, and uh, Kyle does talk about uh, soft cars versus stiff platforms and, and and some other stuff that maybe we can we can uh, bring into the conversation as well. So as you, you're coming into the into the end of the straightaway and you're coming into a, to a braking zone. You know, one of the, certainly we're gonna hit the brakes. I, I'm gonna have you walk through this entire screen, but there is, uh, as I mentioned a little bit ago, there's a lot happening. And I just wanted to uh, have you chat a little bit about this, this layup where, this layout where it's not only the braking is happening, but the downshifting. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, obviously this doesn't really apply to all the paddle shift cars that are up <laughs> these days. But uh, so this is a a manual car where the guy has to go through the uh, the gears while downshifting, and and this is something I've seen quite a lot as well. Drivers tend to um, downshift too early, um, and you know I guess they just kind of want to get it done, right? But they tend to downshift too early and they they're not very good with their timing um so that's kind of what we're seeing here you can see that the the pink line is the rpms and it never really gets down to a low level until the lowest level until you know all the shifting downshifting is done and in fact there's a coasting period right there's a um, coasting period between the the final brake release and the throttle application but you can look at the brake trace and see that you know the driver is releasing, applying, releasing, uh, applying. <laughs> so every time that's doing that, if we look at the uh, longitudinal acceleration at the very bottom in black, you can see that's changing. So that means that load is being transferred every time that driver is releasing and reapplying the brake pedal. So is that that's not a very smooth trace there. Um, and we can see the gears that the driver is you know, going down at that whole period. So, and so he's not, he's just not really getting the blips done appropriately. And I think he's trying to downshift too early in this case. So, you know, I guess he needs to think about, you know, what, what he can do differently to solve some of this. And, you know, my advice would be first, wait to do your downshifts. Second, look at your pedal configuration because if you're having too difficult of a time to heel and toe then you may be able to fix that just by getting your pedals a little bit closer together and i mean height wise um or maybe you need an extension on your throttle pedal or something but whatever it is this process has to be made easier right um because it's important this is the car needs to get through the gear so you're in the optimum gear uh for the corner but you can't take away from the braking because that means that you're leaving time on the table. So that's kind of what's going on here. I seen a uh, a um, a note in the chat a little bit earlier that uh, Jeff Wasilko, friend of the of the of the webinars here, uh, we break for two reasons. One is to slow down, and the other is to transfer weight. Yeah. And which is which is the next couple of slides. So I, I appreciated that when I saw it. The um, the, the, uh, I'm glad you went through a couple of things there. Yes, we're looking at this in a nice little sterile world in our computer screens uh, in, in the trailer, right? And, and, and we see all of this. Of course, there's a lot of stuff happening out there in the, uh, in the car. And you talk, talked about it, uh, you know, the heel and the toe. Maybe it's a rough track coming into it. Of course, he's got cars on both sides of him. Or he's got a car right on his nose. All of these different things are affecting all of this. But, but this, these things are important. It, the that weight transfer that is changing here in the longitudinal G that we can see below because of a poor process of, of the of, of brake pressure, which is in this case happened to be created from downshifting, you know, not quite correctly. You're you're really upsetting the car at a very critical time during that not necessarily straight line braking, but as soon as you went to try to try to turn that car and you're still has and still the chassis is upset, it's uh, you're gonna be losing time in the corner. So, right. okay, let's go to the, you know, that, that was basically a kind of a bad example, a, a good example of a bad example, right? <laughs> uh, so we, we always like to maybe do our best to show, you know, okay, 
what does it look like when it looks correct? If you, as you're coming on, you've apply, applied the brakes and uh, and you're coming down. And this, uh, you mentioned to me that this is not simulation data. This is uh, you, you driving your Formula Ford here. So uh, yeah. real car in this particular case, uh, let's talk through what you're seeing here and what looks correct. Yeah, so the, you know, the Formula F has straight cut gears. So, you know, that kind of makes life a little bit easier a lot of times, but, uh, and I was left foot braking. Um, but you can see if you look at the RPMs and the throttle there in green, I'm not even blipping the throttle. I'm just waiting until the RPMs are as low as I want them to be and popping it into gear. And the RPMs are only changing a few hundred, you know, so it's not upsetting the car. The brake trace is nice and smooth. The GPS uh, longitudinal acceleration is, is pretty smooth. So, you know, that was that was a good you know, series of downshifts, you know, um, and that's kind of what you're waiting for. You really shouldn't go into that lowest gear until just before you're about to turn into the corner. And I see a lot of drivers really try to get that done way too early. Exactly. A number of, of uh, people in the chat talking about throttle and, and brake you're starting to come on the throttle here and you're not yet off of the brake and uh and doing some of that at the same time there's reasons for that and there's downsides to it right, right. and uh you over here on the on the coming off of the throttle and rising the brake looks like that was time pretty well uh, pretty clearly a left foot breaker in this case right and uh, j there's just a little bit of rise before it's coming down but over here on this side yeah, you're you're still loading up that uh, you know that corner as you're starting to starting to throttle up a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about throttle application and brake? Why you might want to or need to, or maybe get into the habit of doing it a little bit, and then the downsides of that. Well, I mean, the downside is if you do it too much, right? Um, you know, but if it's a, a very slight um, overlap, then it's usually not creating a big problem. You know, but what that does though, is it helps balance the car because you're kind of guiding that, uh, that load transfer from you know, the uh, inside tire to the outside tire. Um, so the smoother you can do that, the better, and that kind of helps in that regard. But again, you don't wanna you know, have a bunch of brake pressure and a bunch of throttle <laughs> application at the same time, you know? Yeah, and the car starts fighting itself, right? right. The, uh, the rear tires, mm -hmm. rear wheel drive, we're making an assumption, rear wheel drive, that the, the, now the, front, the rear tires are driving, let alone the, the weight shift things that are happening, but they're driving, the front tires are still trying to slow down, right? And the brakes overcome right. the, uh, the, the rotational power from the engine that can be overcome from, from, from throttle. And you end up with a rear a front, that, front axle that's still trying to slow down and a rear axle that's trying to speed up. And then all of a sudden uh, understeers and all, all sorts of weird stuff can happen. Right. Uh, but if you do it at just the right amount, or of course you're trying to time it just perfectly and a little bit of overlap is not gonna hurt you at all, but boy, any too much and you're you're you're, you're probably going to see a, a corner that is probably screwed up all the way around if you've if you've done that uh, at that transition period right yeah so, okay the uh but look at the look at the longitudinal g he is he is he has transferred the weight up to the front tires uh he's slowing down at a at a pretty good clip here there is a little bit here you know it's always there's always room for improvement, right? You, yeah. you uh, there, there's a, there's just a, a tick here, but it's, and it's right, happens to be right around when he started to do his downshifts. Um, it, it is not much. And then in the, in the car, he probably couldn't even feel it, but uh, uh, right. the data is data and you always look for uh, little things to be able to improve on, right? And then the release, just a beautiful release here. You're, you're, you're releasing brake pressure, releasing brake pressure, and you've got the car probably what you're feeling in the car is the thing has started to, to take that set. And uh, and then you go ahead and you can release the, the brake and start to throttle up. And that's yeah. when we see that transition up to, to positive uh, longitudinal Gs and, and off and running. Yeah, I guess the other point here is that it's much easier on your equipment if you're not, uh, you know, spooling up the engine every time you downshift. So yeah. um, use your brakes for slowing the car down. Use it, use your engine to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not to, not uh, to slow much, much easier on the gearbox to uh, right. uh to not yeah. backload and backlash those gears. 
uh, and th but then uh, you know I've seen seen people that are fighting an understeer and 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 their trail breaking is only can only get them so far to get the car to rotate the first part of the corner, yeah. and uh, and then all of a sudden I watch them and they uh, you know they they'll bang a bang a couple of gears coming down to help the car rotate. It's a uh, you know drivers can do what drivers do what drivers do to make things happen right, uh, you, right. and uh, more power to you right but uh it's 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 good to, and fun to see it in the data but this is a this is a more proper way to do it and, and work on the chassis and, and the tuning of the rest of it uh, peter says brakes are cheaper than gearboxes clutches or axle shafts that, that, <laughs> that and a whole lot easier to change out right good yeah. point okay let's let's talk about something that you 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 mentioned as we were kind of starting up you said there's you know there's all these different things we can check out but uh, uh placement of where you put the car is a big piece of this, right? And and that affects the the, the tightness of the corner you have to to that that you will end up driving around. If you if you come down a straightaway and you are and it's a left hand corner, you should be over at the right edge of the track, getting ready to have the 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 absolute largest radius you can drive around the corner. There is a distinct connection to radius size. Uh, the bigger, the faster you can go. The uh, the more speed you can do and and hold uh, the same you know, maximum lateral g. So let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing here and uh, and and and, uh, and and breaking that down and what some of our folks can maybe take take to their data. Yeah. Well, first we've got speed, obviously, and then um, corner radius, which is the math channel I think we're giving out. Mm -hmm. um, throttle, um, brake, and then the time compare. Um, and again, this is me back on the simulator trying to you know create this awful situation on purpose. So, and, we're, and, and we're looking at two different laps stacked on top of each other. There's a blue and a right. brown. Yeah. Okay. And then on the left is the lines that were driven. Um, and we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. But um, you know, this is something I do see quite a lot and I'll call it creeping, right? If you look at the blue trace, um, it's creeping towards the apex um, instead of staying on the right hand side of the road. Um, I actually ended up carrying too much speed as well. So if you look at the speed trace, you know, there's all the speed being carried uh, by the blue trace and, you know, me scrubbing off quite a bit more speed with the red. Um, but, you know, the thing is what I, Again, a lot of it comes down to the eyes and just trying to rush things. Um, drivers will, you know, think they need need to carry tons of speed into that apex, and they're focused in on it. But then they start turning towards it too early, which can, you know, develop more understeer. Obviously, what happens is you start asking more of the front tires than you need to because now you're trying to get it to turn sharper than the car needs to turn for that particular corner. Um, so what what happens a lot of time, even though there's good speed in or at the point of uh, braking, there's about the same speed. There may be about the same speed coming out, but at that uh, at apex, there's a big speed differential, and in this case, it's about six miles an hour. Um, and truthfully, <laughs> the only thing that saved me on that blue trace was my brake release. So if you look at the brake release on the blue, you know it's that slow release. So I was able to keep the car going around the corner. If I didn't do the brake release like that, I probably wouldn't have made it around that corner. Right about here would have, uh, <laughs> would have been into the grass or the wall, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so why don't we go to the next one, Roger, next uh, slide. I don't remember. Let me, let, let, let's, let, since there was a, a, a quote, a, a comment in the chat, uh, ah, did you, did, okay. did you cover a little bit of the time compare where, where it kind of shows the time gain by the blue going fast? coming yeah. in and right. that uh and that yeah we see this and we see some lost time but in the end you know yeah, not not too bad yeah that's yeah probably about a tenth a tenth or so but tenth is a tenth right yeah you know? and yeah, exactly. to every corner that could really add up <laughs> yeah you know? we, we sometimes we look at our data and we don't want to see these fast in slow out uh things right if you see that your mind immediately goes okay well maybe i overdid it here and 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 but if it only comes back part way, maybe there's this this happy medium where right. yeah, you need to take the right line in, but maybe you can take some more speed than you had with the red lap and yeah, uh, sure. and actually get this to come down a little bit and then stay there and and be over right. here, you know, by with a with a couple of tenths better uh, than what you actually ended up in this particular case. 
Yeah, I did not drive a bunch of laps. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, it, it's it's the whole. The, you know, we're just trying to give some folks some ideas of what to what to work with. It's kind of interesting. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I would say that you know, obviously the the red trace is the correct line, but I'm sure I probably could roll more speed into that as well. That's boy. That's the that that, that is the point. I get. I think I wanted to make as much as anything is. Yeah, we're looking at two laps, right? And there's a. Uh, uh, and there's a distinct difference between how you crept down towards the apex and, and tightened up the corner more than you needed to, but, and you threw out a bunch more speed at it, boy, a third lap or, you know, some more, some more uh, sessions and, and try it and try a couple of different lines and then start to compare them and start to figure out which one, which one was better in the, in the data. Right. Perfect. More detail about this exactly. You know, talk about uh, what what we've done here is we basically zoomed in on on this part right here, and right. then uh, Ray has has thrown some numbers on it here a little bit. Let's chat about what you've thrown or showing here. Yeah, so starting with the brake application, both cars are going about the same speed, right? One thirty one versus one thirty, um, and then as they're coming towards uh, you know the apex, you can see that the blue trace is taking a tighter line, and if you look at the corner radius, it's about a hundred feet at that point where the uh, the two dots are and the red's 130 so right off the bat you know the you can carry more speed around 130 foot radius than you can 100 foot radius and that's showing up here so we have 52 miles an hour for the red and 46 for the blue and even though they're the same speed um you know when they both get the full throttle it's 64 miles an hour Man, if you can carry six more miles an hour at the apex, that's going to gain you time, you know. So, um, yeah, so yeah, because of that bad line in the the blue driver could have held that 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 uh, that that higher mile per hour, you know, and and couldn't do it because because right. at some point you have to turn right. If you come in so so shallow, at some point you have to get the car the the vector to change right on the way right. out, and uh, and it all happened it had to happen here where he, then he had to drop he dropped those. Uh, the, you know those uh, those six miles per hour down below right yep he's he, 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 again simulation and, and you're doing some things here but uh often that will not pay off that you, here it ends up being 64 for both but often you, you end up being um you know that three or four miles an hour slower for oops for the for the next you know, you know next part of the straightaway too so you'll see that often as well right and Kyle, yes, these are the same car, different laps. Yeah, th thank you, thank you. <laughs> yep. Okay. So, as we've been talking about radiuses, we've been talking about breaking down, breaking down the corner, and we're going to transition here a little bit and and take 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 us all into some ways of thinking that through, not just a radius or not just a brake pressure. But uh, in all of the channels that are part of the car, but then uh, Ray has developed some ways of looking at this that 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 uh, are, are substantially quicker and maybe more visual for some of us that like that, where you are seeing the end result of that, the, the load of the car and how it loads the front axle and how it, when you're turning, how it loads the right side axle in, in a left hand corner and what's happening with that load uh, across the time. We've got some math channels here that are that are shown that Ray wanted to include the, these here just so you get an idea, but that we these math channels are available i'm sure uh, Robbie has already. Uh, uh, put the link into the chat but uh, if you're watching this later again on YouTube the the math channels are available for you to download electronically and import into Ray Studio 3 uh, so you don't have to type any of these is, is the whole point but because uh, they are long and complex right but but uh, we did want to show you that there's a lot of happening in the background you're getting a lot of value here for uh, watching this and, and downloading the user profiles and the math channels to do what we're going to talk about here in just a second. Okay. Anything you'd like to add to that, Ray, before I go to the next slide? Yeah, I'll talk about these a little bit. So okay. um, first of all, somebody much smarter than me came up with these and, <laughs> and nobody asked me about cosine or sine or arc tangent because I won't be able to explain <laughs> it to you. So, <laughs> but I found these interesting because um, they do kind of give an estimate of tire load and there's some assumptions being made here. One, it's using combined Gs. If you had shock pots, then you could do some calculations and, and calculate like, you know, pounds of load and things like that. Um, so these are taking the assumption that um, for every tire that gains load, 
there's an equal amount of load being taken away from another tire, okay? And it's kind of diagonal. So left front and, and right rear are, are gonna zero out and right front and left rear are gonna zero out. And we'll see that in the next chart. Um, but kind of what these are doing is basically finding um, spots in a, in a friction circle, the different quadrants. Um, so I, I don't remember how I ran across these, but I started using them. I thought they were pretty interesting. So um, yeah, if you if you look really closely, really the only difference in, in these are right in this in the trigonometric right. functions to make it for the left front tire to, to make it work for the left front or the right front corner left left rear right rear. So, right. Uh, but so a lot of info here, a lot of things happening. But in in reality, they're if you really run through them, they're they're fair, fairly basic. Right. Uh, a question uh, from Gary. Uh, are similar math channels available for Ray Studio 2? The, the same exact math channel will work in Ray Studio 2. There we will need some slight syntax difference, some of these quotes and some other things. Ray, do you have them in a Ray Studio 2 format? I think this will work in Ray Studio 2. Um, I, haven't, the... I haven't gone the other way. They will go certainly yeah. 2 to 3, but I'm, I've, I've not done them the other way. But if, if not, uh, Gary, or anybody else that's watching this later, uh, let me know. I can, I can try them and, and clean up the little bit that may need. To, it may just be the quote marks need to come out. I, I think if that's anything. all it is. Yeah, I think that's all it is. If anything, that's all you would have to do is take those out. So Right. Okay. Um, let's go to the next one. Okay, so now... Now we're applying the math channel. Uh, we've got them in here, right? And then uh, just a quick look at a, a pretty basic, uh, just just the time distance graph and an XY plot showing uh, a scatter plot showing uh, the friction circle. And let's talk a little bit about what uh, what we see here and what uh, what we're showing. Yeah. So this is um, turn one at Sebring. Again, it's me in the simulator, um, and you see, you know, by the trace, it's basically from. The start of brake application to the apex is what we're showing here. Um, so we've got speed, um, longitudinal G reversed. Um, oh, let me talk about that a little bit. So this is how I always look at friction circles. So I've got uh, braking going up. And then uh, the reason why I do that is I'm, I guess it's the driver in me, but I'm always thinking about where the G forces are. So um, if I'm braking, then the the G's are going forward. If I turn into a left-hand corner, then the G's are on my right side and, and vice versa. So that's how I always create my friction circles. It just helps me understand you know, what's going on. So this is a, a left-hand corner. So we've got G's building up on the right-hand side of the car. Um, we've got these uh, math channels here. So uh, every corner and if you look at the numbers, you can see that they're all canceling out. So, you know, the total sum of all those is zero, no matter where the cursor is. Um, and the best way to think of these when you're looking at the traces is that if the trace is going up, then that means that load is being applied. And if the trace is going down, that means load is being taken away. Um, so you can see as the car is going into this corner, um, the right front is loading up. And then as the, the car is accelerating around, the right rear loads up. And then uh, basically as the car comes out, that's, those are all going to even out again. You can see how under braking, both front tires went up and both rear tires went down. So um, that's, it's just a good representation of how that load is moving around the car. Yeah, while you are applying G as the number, it, right. it, it, it really, it almost can be thought of as a percentage, right? There, it, you are very clear that it is an estimated tire load. So right. you, we're not taking into effect the weight of the car and the coil spring and all that, but it's giving you an idea right. of what, where the load is and in, in, in subsequent slides, even, even in a better way. So uh, just think of it that way. I, I think it's a very valuable tool to be able to, um, get your mind wrapped around uh, the chassis loads and, and how you're manipulating the the uh, the weight uh, uh, on the, of the car to the four contact patches, which really is what we're all about, why we're out there doing what we're doing. Right. Okay, yeah. anything else on this particular screen before you go to the next one? No, I don't think so. Okay, so this one, what, let's talk about what you're showing here. So this is basically what I'm doing with the control. So we've got uh, speed again, we've got steering angle, throttle, uh, brake, I probably should have used uh, colors that were a little bit uh, more different there, but brake, <laughs> brake is the one that's uh, uh, coming down pretty quickly compared to uh, longitudinal Gs. 
Um, so yeah, that's the break one there. And then that's longitudinal Gs. So you can see, I, I still have a little bit of overlap between my throttle pedal, pedal and my brake pedal. Um, and then there's a little bit of a lift and you can see from the longitudinal Gs that, yeah, the car did slow up a little bit because of that. Um, so, but this is how I'm managing that weight transfer. So um, that overlap between throttle and brake is helping me do that. The smooth steering input is helping me do that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's and, you, about, and you started to steer a little bit as well, right? So right. there's some lateral uh, included in this as well. Yeah, exactly. probably why this this happened because you were turning in at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. sure it's true. Okay, let's go to the next one, and this is where I, where uh, and, and we have rambled on and, and talked quite a bit and and probably ran ourselves down on time a little bit. But my my fault, sorry, Ray. But this is this is the payoff to the whole thing. All those math channels, all of those different things, you end up with in conjunction with some of these these graphs where it was squiggly lines and you can kind of see some stuff but one of the tabs in the user profile also will that that you can download and and use with your own data because it's a lot of this is based on gps based channels so it would work on a on a, on a solo the um an interesting part here about is these scatter plots and where we can actually start to look at the the, the different corners of the car and red being the most load, you know, the light blue being the less, the, the, the darker blue being a less load. Talk, talk us through this, uh, this little panel here. Yeah. So all the, all the charts are exactly the same. It's all the same friction circle. The only difference is the color channel, which you now have with RS3 analysis and, and you did not have with RS2. So I'm trying to take advantage of this as much as I can. Um, so the corners are labeled and those math channels that we showed earlier correspond to the color channels in each one of these graphs. So you can see that, you know, when I'm breaking for turn one, you know, the, if you look at the left, especially you've got the, the red going up and then stopping. There's a little bit of uh, braking motion in a straight line, but pretty quickly I start turning the car left. And then that's, when you start seeing on the in the right front corner those G loads building up, so you know that's a pretty good transition there from braking to cornering. And as so, basically think about it as as you're balancing this this hot potato from one corner to the next, right? You so um, initially it's it's right at the front of the car. Now I want to move it to the right side of the car. And as I'm turning into the corner and opening my hands, now I'm moving it to the uh, the right rear. And then as I'm straightening my hands, now load is going to start coming onto the left rear more. So it's it's just that whole balance of that load transfer that this is showing. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically what we're seeing here. If you have a little trouble visualizing this at first. One thing that I would do is is build your Race Studio three and maybe add across the bottom the 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 time distance bar with with you know some of the load channels or even the lateral uh, G's longitudinal G's and as you're scrubbing in there you can see where or and the map maybe uh, and you can see when you turn into a left corner you, these little X's will go right where you've got the data in the map and in the in the time distance charts and it becomes a little clearer that uh, uh, exactly where you are and why the car is you know while these traces are moving in certain spots and then the color changes is that calculation of the percentage of load that's uh, that's on the on the different co corners of the car. I think I find it to be uh, it, it, uh, very, very interesting. And the folks that I've shared with, you know, the the concept of it is uh, it is uh, light bulbs have gone on to them and understand a lot better uh, how the how the driver's main job is 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 transferring weight around to the four corner, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road, as they say, right? Right. So perfect. Any other questions about that or comments you want to say? I want to make sure I uh, look a little bit here. Okay, the um, and the, the next one is is um, maybe where uh, let, let me jump back to that one to, that first one. The, by the way, this is like gorgeous. It's it's you look at this one as as a data guy. I'm looking at this and this is like pretty darn good, right? You, you'd sit down with the 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 driver and and talk about it a little bit. And this is not a whole lot we can add here right things are things are looking pretty good uh but but ray as uh you know, had been asked to 
gosh, you know, let's not just show them the perfect world because none of us are perfect, right? And we, we're mm -hmm. all learning and we need to see what a, what a bad one might look like, something that's not quite optimized, maybe not call it bad, right? And right. Uh, uh, what, what would this look like with the, with the data traces onto the side that, that I just mentioned? Now you've got those and we're kind of looking at this. Uh, explain your way through this, this, uh, this slide a little bit. Yeah, so this is some real world data and this happens to be turn seven at Sebring, which is very much a trail breaking corner. Um, so if we look at the traces on the left, you know, we've got the steering, that's, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. The braking, that's the the classic that we were talking about. You know, we got the brake application, a release, and then a reapplication. Uh, this driver does have a little bit of a trail as well, but the, but it's that release and the reapplication that we wanna get rid of. And if you look at the brake velocity, now I've got um, negative brake velocity pretty much equal to brake application velocity. So um, that's exactly what I don't want. So that tells me that, you know, this driver can improve here, right? Uh, probably can brake a little bit later and, and time that whole uh, entry into the apex better. But, you know, to take those and to look at the friction circle now, now we see, if we, especially if we focus on the left front, um, so all the load has come, you know, to the very top um, under braking, but now you can also see the lines going back and forth there and, and the load changing as well. So that is the load coming off of those front tires and back towards the rear tires. Um, so that's, you know, that brake trace is what's created, you know, those on and off moments at the top of that chart there. Um, and then you can see that, okay, now the driver is turning into the corner and suddenly the load drops off. So um, the friction circle is not being maximized. If I, can, if I can have that much load under braking and then I can see basically the same amount of load when the car is at, at, at full cornering, then I should be able to have the same amount of load, you know, joining those two points, right? And having um, more of a circle there instead of it, it dropping off and then building up and then dropping off again. Um, so that kind of shows you what's going on. And you can see when, when this driver accelerates out, that's where you've got the most load, right? She's got the, the, the tire loaded up and accelerating out of there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of interesting when you start looking at those math channels with this, all the different things that are really going on in this friction circle. Yeah. Two, two things. If, if you were to not have it colorized, you could probably already read this right because the, right. the friction circle here it's there's this uh, our friend peter peter kraus that's here uh, watching in the in the chat he always talked about unreal unrealized grip right that was a term he right. used a lot in, in some webinars he's done here with us as well and there's this area up here that is uh that is not being used and it is shown by the color right you got some bright red here so there's a lot of load on this left front in this right hand corner and then right. boom it comes back you know, as the driver did finally get it turned you know, and, and rotating and, and and a big percentage of this was lateral g's but that transition was low there was unrealized grip as they went through here and it, it not only is it in the position on the on the friction circle but also in the color colorization right so, yeah, yep. perfect. Perfect. Okay. And then, uh, and then we have one more where, and we're right here at our, our ending time, but we have one more where, uh, yeah, we're checking driver performance. We always talk about here that there's three parts of data analysis, driver performance, vehicle performance, and vehicle health. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about vehicle health, although this one ties into it, but it, this is vehicle performance. Maybe it's, maybe it's something to the health as well. Well, what do you see here on this, uh, on this, we, this one's not colorized, but it's uh, gives you an idea of, of something else to look at. Yeah, you know, I, I think friction circles can be, you know, really valuable because, I mean, it, it, they tell a story. And in this case, um, I happen to know what was going on with this car, but the car was pulling to one side, which I could see it changing in the friction circle there. And then it, it had yaw under braking. So as the driver was trying to apply the brakes, you know, the, the back end is wiggling, right? Which is not a very comfortable feeling. Um, <laughs> And, and that showed up in the friction circle as well. So I just kind of thought that was interesting, but, uh, but that's certainly affecting the driver's ability to carry as much speed into the corner. You know, if the driver's worried about the back end becoming the front end under braking, then that's not, not such a good thing. 
I have not said it that way, but that is a uh, that is a classic way to say it. The, yeah. <laughs> worried about the back end becoming the front end. The, um, mm-hmm. uh, what, what's interesting is most people might look at this and only see the first half and see that there's a problem, right? Uh, right. But I'm glad you said it. And maybe most people would obviously that would your mind would take over and you say, okay, well, what does that affect? It's affecting the driver's confidence on this side and right. not staying out here where you are, you know, making sure that you're grabbing all of that available grip that's out there. So there's a flatness uh, as it transitioning that weight over to lateral and they're right. not using all of that available uh, grip it, it, because they're, heck, they're a little bit nervous after the car has been dancing around underneath their, underneath their bottom side, uh, at, right at the, at the, at maximum braking. Right. So, perfect. Perfect. The, um, uh, Anything else? Uh, have you have you captured any questions in there? There's some of them there that are pretty deep, and I'm not uh, not sure we'd be able to get there. Uh, John Barnum did, and and Peter answered him in the in the questions. But does downshifting help to increase increase rear tire grip? That it will it will. Uh, and, and Peter mentioned if done correctly, you can help slow the car down a little bit with that at the at the. Uh, um, uh, risk of, of, of parts damage, you're, you're loading gears and, and things in, in a backwards you know, way that they're really kind of designed to do. But boy, any, it just, it's a, it's a fine line. There's a, there's a razor's edge you're walking. And, and if you, if you, uh, too, too little RPM and you let the clutch out and then the tires start chattering or slowing down too much, you end up with a, with a loose, uh, you know, an oversteer on entry, a loose, loose entry, you know, the, right. the rear end starts dancing around and you're going to have that same kind of a feel that you have here with just braking. So that, right. uh, yeah, that whole downshifting too early thing is, uh, is something that should be watched and, uh, and different cars want different things. And, and as we, you and I mentioned, and, and I think you mentioned it as we got started, we're looking at data here and, and, and it's a perfect little world and, and there's squiggly lines, but it um, always keep in mind that there are some corners that maybe would want that, right? Uh, the corner gets loaded, uh, maybe it's uphill and the car won't turn in quite correctly. Maybe a little bit of that help from, a, from an early downshift can help rotate it. Other times if it's falling off and you did it, it would help rotate it right around in, in too much of a hurry. So it's track specific as well. Certainly car specific, a front engine car versus a, you know, a, a mid or back, you know, rear engine cars you react differently to that and, you know, and, and everything else, right? So data right. is the data. It's showing us what to do and what to, to play with. And, and then in the end, you see if it was faster or slower and, and how, you, uh, how you continue on with your development as a driver. And, uh, and the development of the car. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you're looking at data from different types of cars, which I do a lot, you're going to be seeing certain patterns with different kinds of cars. So you, the more you work with it, the more you understand and the more you recognize what's possible and what's not possible. So, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, perfect scenarios here, you know, what we really want to see reality may get in the way of that sometimes you know <laughs> reality does uh, uh, does bite sometimes right so, right perfect let's kind of start to 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 close this one down a little bit let's talk about that uh this video along with all the rest of them that we've done will be out on youtube um uh, we'll have about 220 videos out there after this one goes up and uh, take me an hour or two just to, to work my way through the YouTube uploading process, make sure we get everything everything done correctly. Uh, all sorts of videos up there, all of our webinars that we've done for the last couple of years, two or three years, uh, plus a lot of other ones too. And uh, so, so go visit our YouTube site. Uh, we're a customer support company that happens to sell racing electronics, we like to say, and boy, our folks are out there. Uh, at, at the racetracks uh, like crazy. That's half of our half of our work. Uh, look for us out there with the with the big sprinter vans and set up and, and wandering around. The other half is in the office taking your phone calls and your emails and and uh, doing all the stuff that we do there. So it's a big part of what we do is is customer support. So give us a holler. Look for us at the track or give us a call at eight hundred seven one eight nine zero nine zero. Uh, make sure that uh, if you have some if you have some questions or comments or some needs, make sure you give us a call. We want you to get the most out of these things with uh, and and get it as fast as we can get you up to speed. So make sure you give us a holler. The uh, the next webinar, next webinar, it's it is a month away, and uh, you know it. While I'll say tentative, uh, we're pretty solid on the on on this one, but uh, we're going to take the next step. We've just talked a lot about 
breaking and entry, in, entering the corner. Uh, Tice, who has, has joined us once before as a, as a, uh, a guest here on our webinars. Uh, we met Tice through these webinars and uh, Tice is gonna uh, join us again and talk about some things that he's been working on with Matt Romanowski and uh, uh, different ways that he has found some pretty cool things to do to present the data in, in ways that has been helpful to him and, and uh, folks that he shared it with. So he's going to come on here and he's going to talk about some of those. We're going to talk, it will focus mainly on corner speeds. So, the, so there'll be some on the entry side, obviously, because you, you don't get to the middle of the corner without doing the entry. So he'll talk about that, but there'll be a focus on corner speeds and grip and, and how you can specifically see the time lost, time gained uh, in, in the corners. And he's done done some pretty cool things with re reports and and uh, and some other stuff with some of the tools that are available to you in Race Studio 3. So very much looking forward to that. So that'll be cool. Tice, I know you're here today and uh, looking forward to it. Um, some contact information for Ray, right down there in the in the lower corner. Ray runs Precision Driving Analytics, and uh, he's a busy man. But uh, uh, I know a lot of folks uh, chat with him, talk with him, use him for support, and I know he's always there and does such a great job for uh, uh, for for his AIM customers that, uh, that that need questions answered and support. Uh, there's a phone number. There's an email address. Uh, Ray, I appreciate you coming and joining us again. It's always fun. Always fun. Uh, when I see you at the track or, or, or have a conversation with you anyway, but uh, glad you could join us here today. Is there anything else you'd like to add as we kind of close this one up? Nope. Uh, just thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll do another one sometime. It, as your busy schedule allows, I'm sure. I, th I was hoping that uh, uh, January we could, uh, you know, would be a little bit of a slow time with you, but just, just working with you for the last two or three weeks, it's been, uh, uh, it's been crazy time for you. So I, I, I am glad of that, though. I'm glad you're yep. out there and, and keeping busy. So we uh, absolutely look forward to you coming back and joining us again. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I do appreciate it. Um, there is some... Uh, some talk internally here of uh, uh, we we slowed these down to once a month, but uh, I, we're, we're we're certainly talking about probably doing two two a month, and uh, we've got a, a, my list of things I want to cover have been going up and up and up. So we may go to a uh, uh, the second Tuesday of every month, and we may even change that one that's earlier in the month to not in the in the midday here in the states, but maybe early evening and and do a. Uh, that one at a different time. So we have a, an option of having more of the, the live folks here, maybe uh, uh, for those. And then when we, we do the uh, one at the end of the month, we really, really like doing it this time because we have access to our Italian friends and, and Europeans and, and some other folks. So that's why we do the times that we do them. So I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, more on the, the uh, uh, you know, adding a few if uh, if we decide to do that you'll 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 hear of that through zoom or or uh, um, through through me here at the at the next webinar that we do thanks everybody for coming i appreciate it. again thanks ray for your for all your help and everybody that came today and participated we had pretty good numbers and uh great questions and we'll uh we couldn't get to them all but uh we'll, we'll try to answer those in emails as we go if you're watching this later on youtube uh all of the documentation um uh, some sample data for you to use uh it will all be listed down in the uh in the description below in youtube Thanks, everybody, and we will see you uh, in about a month or so. Talk to you soon. Bye, everyone.